We are glad that you're here today. I hope and pray that if you're visiting with us, that you'll have the opportunity to come and be with this congregation at every opportunity to have. To the Venezuelan brothers that are back there, I had no idea you were from Venezuela. I could have told some stories about that. <laughs> in January of 2020, when I went into Guyana the last time I was there, I got a message a few days before I went in. And the Guyanese had sent me a message from House of Horror saying, Brother Donnie, you need to be on alert. So the Venezuelans have migrated across the river over into Guyana, over in the area where I was going, into Hasaroa, region number one. They said there's no houses, there's no food, there's a huge medical problem. You really need to be concerned about what's going on. And when they first told me about that, I started to stop, and, and we started to even cancel the trip. And I thought, no, we're ready to go. We're going to Guyana. So I traveled into Guyana, and lo and behold, when I got into the interior, when I got to Hasaror, the first people I met was a Venezuelan family that had came over from Venezuela. The brethren there at Hasaror had been kind enough to allow them to move into a house there that we owned. And they were there with the husband, a wife, two grandchildren, and I believe a son was with them. And I thought how ironic it was, the first person, the first group of people that I got to teach was those Venezuelans. And I baptized the grandson and also the son into Christ before we left, and we were hoping and praying that by now probably the husband and wife, they've probably also been baptized into Christ. So we are glad that you're here, and we pray the very, very best for you. This morning, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to the book of Jeremiah, if you'll turn to Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, we're going to talk about Jeremiah going to the potter's house. And we're going to look and see how it applies to us today. We're going to see what God is trying to tell us. It's very evident that during the time that Jeremiah penned these words that the country of Judea was under a great deal of turmoil. There was confusion among the people. There was chaos there was a great confusion as far as the government was concerned. The people's morals was probably lower than they'd ever been. And God calls, Jer calls Jeremiah, and he begins to give him a message that I think is absolutely true to us today. Because we look in our nation today, we, we look at things that are going on in our land, and even though I believe with all of my heart that we still have the greatest nation upon the face of this earth, we still got our problems. We, we see a nation that many have left God. We, we see a nation that the morals of our people of this land are probably lower than they've ever been before. And maybe the message that God gives to Jeremiah is the same message that God can give to you and I today. And, and very basically, as God speaks to Jeremiah, we'll read it in just a few moments. God speaks to Jeremiah. He tells Jeremiah that he was, in the, he was the potter, that the people were the clay, that God had the ability to shape and to mold his people in, in whatever fashion that he chose. But he also said this. But he says, if you rebel, if you fail to repent, then God tells Jeremiah, I'll crush you as a people. I, I think it's a good message for us today. Let's read this morning from Jeremiah, beginning, and let's go back to, once again to verse number 1, and, and let's read this morning through verse number 10, and listen as God is speaking to Jeremiah. Beginning at verse number 1, he says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. I want you to go to the potter's house, and there I'll give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, so that the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Verse number 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, he said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does? declares the Lord. Like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted or tore down and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict upon it the disaster that I had planned. 
And if at any time or another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted and it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will recommend the good that I've intended for it to do. God, what are you saying to Jeremiah? What what are you trying to encourage those people? What, What are you trying to say to the nation of Israel? Is he not trying to say, number one, God is in control. God always has been and God always will be. But you know, there's some other lessons that I think that we can learn from this this morning. Number one, we can learn a lesson that God wants to mold us and shape us into something that is beautiful and something that is useful. Couldn't have said it much better, Brad, this morning when you got up to lead the sing. I mean, how, how wonderful it is to stand before a congregation of God's people. The, the people that have the same mind, the, the people that have the same purpose in life, with people that stand up and sing these beautiful praises unto God as, as we give God the praise and the honor and the glory in which he deserves. God in talking to Jeremiah says, I want to make a nation of people that are beautiful people, people that are spiritually beautiful, people that are God-glorifying people. We sing that in our songs that we sing. We, we sing the beautiful song, To God Be the Glory, because great things He has done. And as we look at our life, as you look at your life, as we think about the purpose that God has given us as we live here upon this earth, I think of words like what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, in verses 19 and 20, he says, You were bought with a price, therefore I want you to honor God with your body. I want you to glorify God. In Romans 10, verse 15, the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church at Rome, he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Think about it. And then maybe one of my favorites. Matthew, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse. Is our Lord is speaking to his disciples as, as he's preparing them for life after his departure, as he's preparing them for life as they live here upon this earth. He, he gives them the instructions and he gives them the hope and he gives them a, a promise. He says, I want you to understand that you are the light that shines here upon this earth. Listen to what he says. He says, I want you to let those lights so shine before men that they may see your good works and that you might glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, I hear almost on a daily basis people talk about they don't know what their purpose is in life. And many times when they say that, I always want to stop and and I always want to think about that. You really haven't read God's word of what it says for you and I in life. Because as God created us and he took the dirt of this earth and he formed us and he shaped us and he molded us in what we are today. Think about it. And he gave us a purpose in life, and that purpose in life, that spiritually, that we be beautiful in the lives in which we live, and the deeds in which we do, that we be useful, that we be suited for the purpose. You know, everything in life has a purpose. If it's nothing more than the automobile in which you drive and, and you get in and you close that door and, and now the law is that you take that seatbelt and you pull that seatbelt up and you lock it, you see that seatbelt has a purpose and that purpose is that it might save your life. Think about it. Everything in life has a purpose. And let me encourage you, let me challenge you as you live your life and as I live my life. God wants to mold us and shape us into something beautiful and useful. But you know, the question comes to you and I. How useful are you and I in the kingdom of God? Think about it. It was Paul who wrote to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians, the second chapter and the twenth verse, where Paul, and in that second chapter, he talks about being saved by grace. He says, it's, it's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Think about it. It's not something that you boast about. But then in verse 10, he says, for you are God's handiwork. You're God's handiwork. You know, I called the class this morning in working in Guyana. One of the things that I've dealt with in the years past and continue to deal with, the, the culture there is in such that the ladies of that country, they're lower than dirt. They're almost like animals. 
And, and you know, to go in and encourage them and to tell them that there's somebody that they've been created by God. Think about it. We, we like to sing the song with the kids and also the adults there, the song, You Are Beautiful Beyond Description. Think about it. You're beautiful beyond description. Paul says, you have been created, you for God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Think about it. God, God created you. He created you just like you are. He, he gave us a purpose in life, and that purpose is that we might serve him, that we might be obedient to him, that we might reach out and touch other people's life by the lives that we live, by the deeds that we do, by the words that we speak. He gave us a purpose in life. A number of years ago, we used to travel with a group from Midway and up to Pitching Forest, Tennessee for Winterfest. And I don't have to tell you how much I enjoyed Winterfest. Man, 15,000 young people up there and singing, being together with all those folks. And you know, one of the highlights of it a few years ago, they had a Jesus painter there. And you know, I realized that we don't have any idea really what Jesus looked like. We, we believe that evidently he must not look much different than the normal crowd because he had to be picked out because Jesus had to kiss him before he be picked out. We don't know what he looked like. It really doesn't matter what he looked like. But one of the highlights of the, of the Winterfest was a Jesus painter there. And he would come in and there would be a, a canvas that was there and he'd take his hands and he'd dip in that paint and he'd throw up on the wall and you know, you'd begin to wonder what he was drawing or what he was painting. It wasn't long before he got through, there was a picture. I remember one of the pictures he had was a picture that kind of depicted Jesus with a crown on his head, a crown of thorns on his head. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the artist, and you and I are his subject. What, what is he painting in our life? Is, is he still working on you and is he still working on me? You see, the potter is patiently waiting and working on us because we are his spiritual work of art. Think about it. Seen this morning on Facebook and there was a small baby on there. They're members of the church there at Sycamore. The baby had his one-year birthday and they were having a party yesterday and the preacher that wrote the word says, well, here's probably another preacher's wife. You know, it might be. We, we, we don't know what God's got in plan, but we know that God has given us a purpose in life. And, and number two, as we think about that, that potter and the clay, sometimes we just don't turn out the way that we hope. Think about it. We don't turn out the way we hope. But you know, don't other things in life do that? You ladies that are cooks, have, have you ever went to that kitchen and you're going to cook up that gourmet meal and you're doing all that work and put all that effort into it and when you got through, it just really didn't turn out the way that it should. You know, sometimes we as humans are that way, isn't it? You know, I've told the story often of one of the young men that was in Ghana, Gavin Campbell. Some of them said Gavin Campbell was a Donnie Mitchell in dark color. Man, he was high energy. He had a great deal of excitement. He could lead singing. He, he was just an energetic ball of fire. We had high hope for Gavin. But you know, Gavin let the devil lead him astray and allowed the devil to, load, to destroy his life. Think about it, the devil to destroy his life. You, you see, we're clay, and we're, 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 we're makeable. The idea is clay, that we're moldable, and, and we got to let God shape our life, and we got to let God mold our life, and we got to let God allow us to be what we need to be in life. But just face it sometimes, brother, sometimes we get hard like cement. And you know, we're kind of like the old man that talked about his mule. He was hollering at his mule. The mule just stood there, and one of the farmers came by, and he says, is that mule, is he deaf? Is, he, is, is there something wrong with his hearing? And, and the farmer says, no, he's not deaf. He's just hard-headed. You know, sometimes we're just hard-headed. We, we refuse to let God mold us and shape us in what we need to be in life. You ever been there? You know, I think of men in the Old Testament much like that. I, I think about Saul, who Saul could have been a great leader. He could have been a great leader of the country. He could have been a great king for God's people. But yet Saul was so hard-headed, he had to do things his way. 
God tells him to go literally destroy the Amalekites. And Saul all of a sudden decides, I'm going to do it my way, God. Well, when I think about people that are hard-headed, I think about people in the Old Testament like Jonah. You know, just as simple instructions to Jonah. Jonah, I, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach the gospel. And, and what does Jonah do? He turns around and he runs in the other direction. Think about it. And then maybe I think about my favorite. And I want you to think about that just for a minute. My favorite may be Peter. You know, one of the greatest compliments I suppose I've ever had in preaching the gospel, I know there are people that can preach the gospel better than I can, and that's great. I know there are people that can probably do mission work far greater than I can, and that's great. But I have people so many times in planning these churches and just going back and visiting churches. Where they say, you know, you're much like the Apostle Paul. And when they say that, I always like to stop and say, uh-uh, no, no, not Paul. How about Peter? You know, Peter was the only man that I know that's in God's Word that's recorded that every time he opened his mouth, he stuck his foot in it. Think about it. Oh, he was bold in saying, Lord, you can count on me. It reminds me of one of the brethren in Guyana a long time ago. We were having a little problem with one of the churches there, and we went out to see him. We sat down and we talked to him, and we were saying, look, here's what you need to do. You need to get away from where you're at. Here's where you need to be working. And I won't ever forget what he says. It won't ever happen to me. Peter was that way. Lord, it doesn't make any difference. If everybody in your kingdom forsakes you, you can count on me. I'm going to be the number one man there. And what does Jesus say? Peter, you need to think about what you're saying. And what did he say about Satan? And Satan wants to sift you like wheat. And Peter wasn't satisfied. Oh, he has to bold, be bold again and say, Lord, you know, in, a, in Luke, the 22nd chapter, the 31st verse, and it goes on down from verse 31, Peter says, but you know, Lord, if everybody else forsakes you, you can count on me. And what does the Lord say? Peter, this day, before the cock crows, you're going to die me three times. Think about it. How many of us are much the same way? We just don't listen to what he says. And, and the point is, the potter can crush the clay if it doesn't turn out right. And then what I think about when I talk about that potter and the clay, however, God wants to start over with us many times. You know, my mom and dad are both passed away now. I've told you many times. A lot of you know my background as far as being raised. If it wasn't for a mom... Probably wouldn't be preaching this morning, Brother Brad. Mom carried us to church. Dad never went to church with us. Not he wasn't concerned about me spiritually or my other brothers spiritually. But mom's one the one that put in the hard work. And, and I don't know how many times, and I've told the church so many times, I don't know how many times as I was growing up. And, and I remember when I got 18 and got my driver's license. And one of the privileges I had, I was going to get to be able to drive to church. And I remember going to church, me driving to church. Really, the only reason I was going was I drive to church. And I won't ever forget getting there and pulling up in the parking lot and telling mom, you might make me go now, but when I get older, I promise you, you won't make me go anymore. Oh, how I hate the, how I eat those words. But aren't you glad that God is patient? Aren't you glad that he's patient? Now, aren't you glad? And, and you know, I'm afraid so many times in life, we look at people's lives, those that are sinful, those that are rebellious, those people that are rebelling against God and rebelling against the church, and we have the attitude is we, we don't care if they're lost or saved, but yet God is patient. And what does God say? God says in Peter, in 1 Peter, the third chapter to ninth verse, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And aren't you glad that God is patient? I, I don't want us to be like the woman that prayed for patience. God, I want it right now. But God's so patient. Peter didn't understand it. Peter's going to go out on a limb and, Lord, how many times am I going to forgive that brother that sinned against me? Seven times, Lord. And the Lord says, wait a minute, Peter. You haven't even begun to scratch the surface. And then maybe my favorite, oh, that prodigal son that you read about in Luke, the 15th chapter. I, I don't know what made that prodigal son come to his senses. 
You may look at your life and think about a time that you were rebelling against God. What, what caused you to come to your senses? What, was it some kind of a direct operation of the Holy Spirit of God working in your life? I don't know. But in the story of the prodigal son, I see a son that already had made up everything he's going to say, and he's going to go back to his father, and he didn't even want to be a part of the family. He said, just make me one of your hard servants again. But not God. See, we're going to kill the fatty calf. And we're going to call our friends together. We're going to have a party. And we're going to rejoice because my son was lost and now he's found again. You, you see, God's got his limits. And even though God has got so and God is so patient, his limit at some point, God's patience and God's ability to save is going to stop and he's going to turn us over to a devil. That's what he's telling Jeremiah. But you know what he's saying to us this morning as we close? It's telling us that the future is changeable. I don't know what the future holds. But I can tell you one thing this morning. I knew who holds the future. There, there are certain things that I know without any doubt. I know without any doubt that the Bible teaches that someday that life's going to come to an end for each and every one of us. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. And I want you to think about it. The reason we don't know is because if God had told us, we couldn't have stood it. But what he has told us is this. Life is going to come to an end someday. And what he tells us is this. As the future is changeable, God can change and man can change. Think about it. This morning, you may be here this morning and you may be rebelling against God. This morning, you may be here and maybe you haven't allowed God to mold and shape your life the way that God wants to change it. But let me tell you something this morning. God is willing to do it. We're in the hands of the potter right now. And being in the hands of the potter, it tells me this thing most importantly. It tells me whether we're going to be saved or whether we're going to be lost someday when life is over. Think about it. Just imagine what we can be. Just imagine what we can be with God's help and God's ability if we allow him to change our life, if we allow him to mold our life, if we allow him to direct our life as we live here upon this earth. But it's up to you and me. You know, everywhere I go, you'll always hear these people say and talk about the idea of how loving God that we have, and we do have a loving God. You, you hear time people talk about God's grace and God's mercy and God's love and God's understanding and all these things, and every one of those things are true. And then you'll all make hear someone say, well, do you believe that a loving God could send a soul to hell someday? And always when they say that, I always like to stop and say, no, 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 no. God's not going to send anybody to hell. All God's don't do is grant our request. Whatever we chose to live in this life. My favorite scripture in the New Testament is found in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 58th verse. My Bible study class on Wednesday night probably can quote it better than I can because I quote it almost every service. And Paul, as he stands for the brethren at Corinth, and, and I think about the brethren that was there, Paul in planning the church, Paul in encouraging the church, they were struggling in so many areas. He closes in that 15th chapter in the 58th verse. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Well, if we need anything in the church today, we need people that are steadfast. People that are unmovable. People that are always abounding in the work of the Lord. And you know why? Because Paul says, for as much as you know is your labors not in vain in the Lord. Let me ask you as we close. Are you allowing God this morning to shape and to mold your life? Are you allowing God to work in your life and allowing God to make you and to make me what we ought to be in this life? Are you allowing God to shape and mold our lives so that we get the fullest benefits of life each day that we live and that we're a blessing to this world in which we live? Are we stubborn and hard headed This morning there's water that's prepared. 
Follett told me a while ago when I got through with the class and I was telling you that one of the pictures that I showed you was a picture of those people that were chopping the hillside out. I told you a story. That wasn't what it was. That was the men that were walking down the hillside ahead of us going down to the area where we were going to baptize those two Venezuelans. They had to walk down a rough hill. And we got down there and there wasn't much water that was there. We had literally had just hold them down just to get enough water to get immerse them in water. But you know, this morning, you don't have to worry about that. There, there's a, a, baptist, a baptist here this morning. There's a Harpeth River not far. There's a Cumberland River not far. There's water you can be immersed in this morning. And you know, it's not the water. It's an answer of a clean conscience to God. Being immersed in water, having our sins washed away, and becoming a part of the kingdom in which Jesus Christ died for. Maybe you're here this morning, you've wandered away. And maybe you've stopped allowing God to shape your life and to mold your life and to direct your life. What did we talk about this morning? God's patience and God's love and God's mercy. He's begging you and he's begging me to come back home. He wants us to be a part of that kingdom. Won't you come this morning while we stand and while we sing?